Hi, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here at Rocco Winery with Rollins Souls and Corby Stonebreaker Souls. It's August 8th, 2018. And our first question for both of you is why wine? <laughs> you go first. Let me go first. Mm -hmm. Please. Um, it was just uh, one of those youthful things where uh, young people uh, try to figure out what they want to do in life. And then the second thing is where do they want to do it? And I was lucky enough to be at Texas A&M and uh, wanting to go uh, naively go work in farms for a summer throughout Europe as an excuse to travel through Europe doing the old backpack thing. And my biochemistry professor uh, put me in touch with his cousin who turned out to be one of the Switzerland's greatest you know, viticulturists and a, a leader at the very beginning of uh, sustainable farming. And this was in uh, Switzerland, west, uh, east of Zurich, and he grew Pinot Noir. And so I worked a summer with uh, Hans Uli Kesselrink at Bach, at Bach uh, Schlossgut Bachtobel. And uh, it was awesome. I met all these wine growers from all through Switzerland. Uh, he was passionate about wine. His father had been, his grandfather had been, and he had a monster cellar and working in those Pinot Noir vineyards, super steep, with a view of the Sentis and the background. I just thought, wow, this, this isn't bad. And uh, so that's when I decided that's what I wanted to do with grow grapes and make wine. Did you have any introduction to wine before that? Was it kind of out of nowhere? With my parents, uh, we had lived in uh, Spain. And so it wasn't uncommon to have wine at our dinner table. We weren't, my parents weren't big collectors or anything like that, but yeah, they enjoyed a glass of wine and I think it all got derived from our time in Spain. But also you went on to graduate school then to study wine. Right, so when I got back uh, after that summer, um, I applied to Cornell and Davis and got accepted to both for grad school and um, decided to go to Davis. And my joke is they had a qu quota for foreign students <laughs> and my Texas accent was pretty strong then <laughs> and so they let me in. And Corby, how did you get introduced to wine? Um, I suppose because I um, married somebody at that time, Ken Wright, who was certainly interested in wine. Um, I'd known him from high school, and after high school, he went in, you know, went on to college at UC Davis, and we had um, kind of gotten together prior to that. So when he graduated from Davis or left Davis, um, we had gotten together and were living together at that time, and. He was out looking for a job in the um, industry of um, waiting on tables, because that's how he put his, himself to school. Mm -hmm. And I kind of encouraged him at that time. I said, don't go be a waiter. This is your opportunity. And got a job in the um, Sierra Madres at a small, in California, at a small winery. And that's kind of how we started. We moved there and from there to Monterey, and he was working in the Salinas Valley, and then on to a property, Talbot Vineyards at that time, where we lived right on the property. Um, Roland was a winemaker, and then from there we just said, hey, you know, he wanted to go to Oregon. Oregon was the next place mm -hmm. where somebody who was young could actually begin a winery, mm -hmm. so we ended up here in 1986 and um, founded Panther Creek Cellars at that time. So, what was your route to Oregon then, from, from uh, studying through Spain, Spain abroad, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. let's try that again. What was your route from Switzerland to UC Davis and then up right. Oregon? So, uh, when I was uh, in grad school at Davis, one of my roommates was a, a fellow named Rich Cushman, who's part of the Oregon wine scene. He grew up in Hood River, and all he talked about was Hood River, Hood River, Hood River. <laughs> and so one spring break, we decided to come up to wine country here and uh, visit, and that was 1979. Mm -hmm. 
and um, it was it was it was awesome. I mean, Tualatin was still around, so we saw Bill Fuller and we saw the uh, Campbells over in um, uh, Elk Cove, Adelsheim, mm -hmm. Dave Lett, and uh, visiting Dick Ponzi was a, was awesome too. We were tasting the beautiful 78s, which were a uh, phenomenal vintage for uh, Oregon at the time. Um, Fred Arterberry was alive and, and kicking and he was great too. I just thought, you know, number one, the Willamette Valley was so drop dead beautiful. That was the second piece was I knew where I needed to to do what I would like to do. Mm -hmm. number, uh, and then the second part was the energy with all those early people was so genuine and open and I've, I, I wanted to be part of that. Mm -hmm. And I felt strongly that after some experience, I could contribute you know, to the success of the Willamette Valley. So that point, that became your goal was getting back to Willamette Valley. So Absolutely. Tell, us, tell us about the route you took to get there. Well, the thing you gotta, I had it, I felt strongly about is getting a piece of paper from grad school doesn't mean very much. And so I wanted to go work for great places mm -hmm. and get experience uh, before I came back. And so that's what I did. I worked around the world and, and, then, and then finally moved permanently to uh, Willamette Valley in 1986, which is concurrent with Corby uh, moving here. Can you highlight some of the experiences you had working in the, some of the places you worked or some of the uh, some things you learned in that kind of pre orient journey? Um, well, I worked at um, uh, in Napa Valley, Chateau Montalena, and that was a great experience. Um, at the time, you know, Chateau Montalena would have been one of the top few wineries um, in, the, in, in America at the time. We made Chardonnay, and we made Zinfandel, and Cabernet Sauvignon, and a little bit of Riesling. Mm -hmm. That was phenomenal. Uh, then, after a couple of years there, I went back to Hanzuli Kesselrink and worked a, vent, a proper vintage in Switzerland, which was amazing as well because it really taught me the no matter how bad the weather gets here during a growing season in the Willamette Valley, it's not any worse than what's ever happened in Switzerland, that's for sure. <laughs> it, they really understood. It gave me, a, and I got to work with uh, the university there in Vadensville on a project which was a great exposure mm -hmm. uh, because subsequently in the Willamette Valley we reached out to the Swiss and to the French, et cetera, for help. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a, a good experience. From Switzerland I went and worked about three years in Australia mm -hmm. and um, at a great place called Petaluma became one of the first flying winemakers where we would fly into a dysfunctional winery that needed a lot of help and, and within 48 hours or, or sometimes three days we would go through the entire cellar cleaning everything that they had, putting in protocols for proper winemaking and that was you know no sleep but lots of work and we, it, was, it was a great experience. I really learned how to handle problems in winemaking and make good decisions and mm -hmm. got some very good what you would call SOPs about winemaking from mm -hmm. those guys. They're true, true profesh professionals. And that was with a guy named Brian Crozer. Uh, and what about, you were in Washington at one time making wine? And I too? took a break from Australia and I made wine at Warden's Washington Winery and uh, up in Spokane. Right. And that was a, that was one of those key experiences where you you found your limits and uh, totally freezing cold. Freezing cold. It was like oh my god, and it was yeah, frightening. So I totally uh, made huge mistakes. The first vintage corrected those, and then the second vintage put that to bed and bottle, and they got the heck out of there. <laughs> It was, yeah, crazy, crazy place to work. And it was Rollins' relationship with Brian Crozer in Australia <clears throat> that brought him here to Oregon. Correct. So what had happened was at Petaluma in Australia, I was the chief winemaker for another winery called Wira, Wira, which we were contracted to make wine for. 
Um, and then we made wine from all these different regions throughout South Australia. And um, Brian Crozer, uh, at a moment of weakness, I guess, came to me and said, I want you to be my chief winemaker. And I said, well, let me think about it. And 24 hours later, I realized I'm fairly loyal and that I would be so loyal that I wouldn't have to give up my dream of coming to the Willamette Valley if I accepted that position. Number one. And number two, I didn't believe he would ever hand over the full reins <laughs> and I wanted to have control. And uh, so 24 hours later, I came back and said, I, you know, I'm not going to respectfully decline and I want to go to the Willamette Valley. And then it was Brian Crozer's time to think and he went away for a couple of days and came back and said, okay, if you're determined to go, I'm upset that you are. I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can put together some financing to help you get something started in the Willamette Valley. So Brian Crozer became, we became actually um, uh, the Willamette Valley's first foreign investment. Right. And it came from Australia. Yeah. And they founded the first sparkling wine house in Correct. Oregon. Yep. That's through right. Argyle. That's right. There's a lot to come back to there, but my, my first question for you is, as the first foreign business to come into Oregon, what was the reception like from the, the people who were here already making wine? <laughs> I don't know, I'll let you answer that. <laughs> we were, so Roland and I met in 86. Um, also, in fact, as I was moving in, because we had um, similar friends here in the valley, he was one of the people who helped Ken and I move into our first place here in the valley. So we've known each other for over 30 years because of that. Um, our families were both friends from then on. But uh, at that was the time in 86, 87 when a small group of us in McMinnville, because I was with Panther Creek, were founding um, the International Pinot Noir Celebration, mm -hmm. uh, which was really founded by a man named John Roothouse, who was a real estate, uh, realtor, he owned a Caldwell Banker there, and his interest was in using the wine industry to bring people to McMinnville so he could sell more real estate. What and Hewlett, yeah. <laughs> and Hewlett Packard was there too and they had yeah. that same interest. So the president and vice president of Hewlett Packard and Susan Sopa Blosser and myself and John and Nancy Ponzi and Nick who owned Nick Rex restaurant, David Lett, David Adelsheim, we all kind of got together and thought, okay, this is what we're going to do. And that's another story. Build the International Pinot Noir Celebration. It took us a couple of years. And um, the feeling was that, one, what the hell was Rollin doing starting a <laughs> sparkling wine house in um, production facility in Oregon when we were all focused on Pinot Noir? We thought Pinot Noir was our um, our shining star to bring people to Oregon to recognize the Oregon wine industry. And so, um, on the second year of the International Pinot Noir <laughs> Celebration, because Rollin couldn't participate, he's only making sparkling wine, we went to him and said, okay, we're gonna create a Sunday brunch that focuses on sparkling wine. Yeah. And they said, you, Corby, you know him, you go get him and see <laughs> if we can get him to come in with some sparkling wine. So yeah. they were all pretty like stunned that he was, you know, building a um, sparkling wine production facility where they all thought that this was Pinot Noir mm -hmm. country. And so they were questionable as to <laughs> how intelligent he might be <laughs> and what kind of decisions. I know. And yet, you know, he and Brian Crozer were well respected, <clears throat> so we were all playing like wait and see, mm -hmm. let them fall on their faces first, you know, yeah, and no. they never did that. They, uh, created a very successful business and um, made it uh, the United States and internationally uh, recognized that sparkling wine can be grown mm -hmm. and produced in this area. So it was pretty interesting. Yeah. It was fun. The International Pinot Noir Celebration was the debut for the very first showing of Argyle's yes. first brew. Wow. We, we, we didn't trust um, custom um, people to disgorge our wines in California, so I air freighted cases of wine <laughs> to Australia. 
had it disgorged there, worked through the, the dosage, all that stuff, yeah. got it you know, all packaged up, labeled everything, and air freighted it back just in time for International Pinot Noir celebration. Yeah. That was our first Sunday brunch featuring <clears throat> Argyle! <laughs> and I remember Dave Lett, you know, early early on when this was all coming down, I, r I ran into him at the post office and he goes, I don't like your sparkling wine. And, and I go, well, Dave, you haven't ever tried it. He goes, I don't know. I just think that's kind of crazy. And, right, right, right. <laughs> and then a, a number of years ago, later, we ended up selling Argyle through the same company that he sold through briefly. And he came into the, for the first time ever into our tasting room at Argyle. And I go, Dave, what are you doing here? I always call him Mr. Lett. Mr. Lett, what are you doing here? It's Dave. And uh, he says, I thought since we sell together, I should taste your wines. And he was just like glowing and generous and, and really super kind. And uh, he goes, you know, I didn't believe you at the beginning. <laughs> he was a funny guy. Right. And so, eventually our gal created Pinot Noir. So, correct. Yes. So tell me about your initial, once you, once, once they, Brian said, okay, we can put some money together, we're going to start something in Wyoming Valley. What happened next? What were your plans? What was your goal with Argyle? Um, well, Argyle, we, I think we all, we went for sparkling wine because um, at the time we felt like viticulture in the Willamette Valley was um, not uh, consistent. So you'd make a great Pinot Noir one year and then not so good the next year. Uh, but we knew we could make sparkling wine highly consistent year after year after year, which is the most important thing in a in a any re wine region, but especially an aspiring mm -hmm. great wine region, which is Willamette Valley. So that's why we did sparkling wine. Basically, we knew it was the right place uh, in the new world to do a high-end, beautiful sparkling wine. Uh, but market forces, as, and as we got our viticulture together, allowed us to start making Pinot Noir. And, and Chardonnay, I actually started making Chardonnay from the beginning in 1987. Uh, I had my first top 100, and it might have been Oregon's first top 100 in Spectator, and it happened to be Chardonnay, right. 1987 Chard. But financially, we had money from Australia, a guy named Ian Mackney, who uh, was a mining magnate. and. Uh, with diamonds such argyle. Yeah, and we named the winery after the uh, world's largest diamond mine, which is in West Australia, called the Argyle Diamond Mine. They're famous for making pink diamonds. And people who settled the town of Dundee came from the county Argyle. And so we kind of put it in. in I think you should buy diamond. me a pink diamond just this. I know. We'd have to, we'd have to no. sell Rocco in order to do it. <laughs> <laughs> They're expensive. <laughs> uh, but what happened then was uh, we had a New York um, investor who was the importer for Petaluma. And his name was Robert Chatterton. He was a very well known and eccentric, super eccentric uh, wine importer uh, based out of the Rockefeller Center in New York. And uh, he provided 50% of the, of the support. And eventually that fell apart and one partner wanted to buy the other partner out. And we had made a, a, a relationship with Cal Knudsen, who owned Knudsen Vineyards, which was one of the largest winery, uh, vineyards at that time up in the Dundee Hills. And uh, it was awesome. Cal Knudsen uh, subsequently got excited about Argyle, mm -hmm. brought in a bunch of his uh, friends who were big investor type people from Seattle and Portland area and Cal sold his shares in Knudsen Erath Winery so it became Erath Winery and became our chairman and a, uh, a, a significant shareholder of Argyle. And thus Argyle acquired <coughs> the rights to all of the um, Knudsen vineyards <coughs> and to this, to this day Correct. they are. Correct. Um, still go to Argyle, although a per percentage of them, Cal, always allowed for Rocco to use too. Right. Was there a particular interest in, in Chardonnay, from the, since you, you mentioned it from the very start and an early award-winning wine, did you have a particular interest in it? Uh, um, we made um, probably one of the world's best Chardonnays at Petaluma Winery. So I felt really strongly that 
uh, we could succeed here making Chardonnay using some of the things that I'd learned how to make Chardonnay in Australia. And so there was, yeah, we were definitely going to make some Chardonnay here. And at the time, boy, there was, Chardonnay was pretty rough here in the Willamette Valley. It still is a hard sell. Corby and I were a part of a, it was kind of fun as young people. We had a tasting group and we would get together, we'd bring our own glasses and a little yes, six-pack carrier. None of us could afford a set of glasses. <laughs> exactly. So everybody had to bring their own glasses and then we'd have a theme, you know, like, okay, this, this Chardonnay or that cab or whatever and sit around and, and act like we knew what we were talking about. And I remember the, one of the worst tastings I've ever attended ever anywhere in the world was 1986 Willamette Valley Chardonnay. Oh my God. Me personally, I didn't think I was going to survive it. <laughs> that was pretty it, bad. Oh, it was so bad. And uh, so our first Chardonnay at our guy was 87. I was determined to, to, you know, try to crack the code, as it were. What were you doing differently that you had learned in your travels, and especially in Australia? What were you doing differently than the people who were already here growing grapes in the Wild Valley? Um, well, we took to heart the concept of capacity. And so at the time, our, you know, Knudsen Vineyards in particular uh, was a very vigorous place. And it was vigorous because uh, farming-wise, the, the number of buds had been kept down per acre. And so, you know, it had lots of growth. And that needed to be balanced. We needed to rein in the growth of each vine. Mm -hmm. And so we managed a technique to create more buds per acre more buds per vine to try to to damp down the growth of any particular shoot and then we would go back through and cut off fruit and open up the canopy all those kind of things mm -hmm. so it was mostly understanding the capacity of a vineyard um, and trying to get that under control and then determining where in the vineyard you might be able to make still wine from pinot and where in the vineyard still wine from chardonnay when we arrived here in 86, um, one of the things that I was aware of at that time was that um, the founders of the Oregon wine industry, wonderful people, hadn't come from a wine background. Mm -hmm. So they didn't know about wine. They were really finding their ways. They really didn't know what grew well here or how to manage a True. vineyard. You know, and we're, we're talking the Ponzi's and Adelsheim and, um, E-Rep and um, Sokol Berlosser, none of them came from a wine industry, but as the 80s came in, and it was slow, because when we arrived here, there were less than 25 brands even. So, but as Ken Wright and Rollin, and we all came in, what we all brought to the industry, I thought, was knowledge. Mm -hmm. Um, not that anybody wanted to listen to it at the time, but they were also aware that we had all planted vineyards before from scratch, were growing vines before, were making wine before, so had more knowledge. So I believe at that time the industry started to grow by the sharing of that knowledge, mm -hmm. more people coming with a background, whereas the founders really made it possible because we knew them we could grow grapes here and because they laid that path, mm -hmm. we all came with more knowledge, even though we were still young, so there was so much more to learn. Um, it took the industry up one more step. Mm -hmm. And there weren't a lot of new people in that time, but enough who came from the wine industry and other areas and said, oh man, this is a new growing industry. Um, but it also took the learning curve up one mm -hmm. step. You know, what we knew coming in was that, you know, in our, in our case, you know, my case, was that we were growing in cool climate regions of Australia. Um, I had experienced what was going on viticulturally in Switzerland, and, um, and Cal Knudsen was totally devoted to, if it's, you know, his quote was, Rollins, are going to make better wine? And I go, yeah, I guess I don't care what it costs, let's just do it. And so in 1987, he had a block of grapes torn out. We planted higher density than had been planted there before, you know, narrower rows. 
um, use this upright trellising that the Alsatians and the Swiss would use. Uh, and, the, and another, and we had that in Australia as well. But the other thing that came through from Australia was irrigation. We recognized that you can go 90 days with no rainfall here. And to ask a vine to properly ripen fruit and with the kind of fruit flavors that are going to allow the wine to live a long time, you can't go without water. Mm -hmm. And so Knudsen Vineyards became probably the first old established vineyard to put in irrigation in, on old vines. So vines that are planted in 72, 74 got drip lines added to them. I'm curious about the the industry really almost doesn't exist in the 80s. Like there's, you say, 25 brands. There, nobody really knows much about Oregon wine. There have been a few successes, but as you're coming into it, um, what were the, the, the sort of the tensions like in terms of you have this kind of group of pioneers who've been here fighting the wars, trying to drag themselves up, and now you're coming in with your knowledge. I'm curious what their reaction was to your methods. Somewhat... Um questionable because here they were and I think there a lot of their expectations were that we would come to them and ask them um, for knowledge what should we be doing you know and everything like that and while we were all fr friendly and sharing knowledge everything we knew we also I think they were wary mm -hmm. you know hey, this is our, we've done it all, we know what's going on here, you know, you want to know something, you come to us. And in our case, you know, I remember Dick Lett um, telling me Dave. years, because we worked on Pinot Noir celebration together, and I had to establish myself, you know, as, hey, I'm here in the industry too, and I was the youngest person on the board. Um, but. David says, I want, I want you to know I was pretty mad and I don't really like that <laughs> Ken Wright because, you know, he didn't even bother to came, come say hi to me when I got here and ask me what was <coughs> going on. And, and it's true. We sort of came in with, okay, we know what we're doing. We're going to get out there and, and see what we can do and make work. And so it took him a while to realize, okay, there's a new wave coming mm -hmm. in. And so our generation was the first wave of new people in after the founders. Mm -hmm. Um, and I can't press enough how much groundwork they did for all of us. Mm -hmm. But I, th I think they um, opened up as a while after a while, and uh, it was always fairly friendly and welcoming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I att attended pretty much every meeting I could, you know, to talk about grapes and all that kind of stuff. And, and it, it, yeah, they became very welcoming. Yeah. Um, and we were buying grapes from different sources and different growers. And that was, we realized strongly that a rising tide lifts all boats. And so it was really important to all of us to work, find a way to work together. So, Kirby, tell me about uh, Panther <coughs> Creek starting at basically the same time as Argyle. Uh, what, were the, what, what was it you were trying to accomplish? With, what, was, what was trying to accomplish with Panther Creek and, and what was your role in it? Um, I think that Ken probably, if you've interviewed <coughs> Ken, probably can speak to that more directly than I can because my role was really in marketing and supporting and supporting the family. One person worked at the winery, you know, and um, the other person was out working mm -hmm. a job and I had two jobs. I was working for the Willamette Valley Wineries Association at that time was the, um, we were just um, Yan yeah. Hill County. Right. So I was a managing director there of the wineries doing marketing and sales and pulling them all together and then doing the marketing for the International Pinot Noir Celebration. Then I went on to be its director in its its um, uh, third and fourth year. Mm -hmm. So I was working in the industry and my role was to um, use that position in many ways to market Panther Creek mm -hmm. and keep it going um, and raise recognition of our brand uh, and you know kind of hands-on stuff bottling and getting people in there because we did it all ourselves mm -hmm. in those days yeah tell me about the challenges of marketing Oregon wine in the 1980s um, extremely difficult um, for one thing Oregon wasn't recognized as a wine producing state at mm -hmm. all 
and I think that we all felt, and one of the premises of the Pinot Noir celebration was that the only way we can really tell an organ is about here, being here in Oregon, in the ground, and mm -hmm. seeing the property, and that's why we um, use that premise for the Pinot Noir celebration. We have to actually get him here, people here, get them to understand Oregon, mm -hmm. and to see it before we're ever going to be able to market it because we're very um, centered on place and even to, even today we are. It's all about to our in the place. So that was the premise. Get people here and then they'll get Oregon. They'll get Oregon Pinot Noir. Um, so it was a book, you know, it was difficult to even get people to taste your wines, you know, out in the road, sampling wines. They didn't necessarily get Oregon Pinot Noir at all because we were like nobody else. Mm -hmm. We were very definitely, you know, to our driven Oregon. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's difficult. And Raul, what about your early experiences trying to sell wine in Oregon? Um, well, I'm trying to remember, in 86, maybe Oregon had two million people. Not even that. You know, teeny yeah. tiny. Mm -hmm. So nobody lived here. So, so as a consequence, and across America, most Americans didn't even didn't know where Oregon was. They would think it's the higher populated California, and then higher populated Washington, and then we get we're in Canada. And wait a second, there's Oregon in the middle. And so you'd do a sales call, and the first thing you'd have to do is say, "Well, here's where Oregon is." You know, it's torture. It and, was. And then, oh yes, we do grow grapes there. And then you have to go, "Well, here's the grapes that we do grow." And then the third part was, back then, Americans didn't drink Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. My joke used to be that America, all, uh, that uh, one little winery in California called Acacia made all the Pinot Noir that Americans wanted to drink. To drink. And so it was, it was tough. I mean, there was a time in the 80s when, when people tore out Pinot Noir vines and replanted with Chardonnay and Mira Turgau and Riesling just white wines that they could release quickly and get some cash back. So the, it's hard to believe young people today here in the Willamette Valley go, really, you tore out Pinot Noir? Go, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, it was not, not that easy for all of those reasons. This question for both of you then. So since you came into it at basically the same time, tell me about some of the steps you saw, some of the moments you noticed that Oregon was starting to grow as a region, whether it was uh, an event or, or, or something of the like that made it, Oregon sort of seemed like it was on the map while you're in your first you know, couple of decades in the industry. I think that Druin coming to the area was Absolutely. part of that. And again, a lot of that was the Pinot Noir celebration. Mm -hmm. We brought in international crowd and that did so much more than just market Pinot Noir. It marketed the area. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of a sudden, McMinnville became this sought out area. Everybody who came there, this is where I want to retire. And lo and behold, they are out there. Um, but also, people from France came, mm -hmm. and from Australia, and from all over the world, and they started to go, oh my god, this looks a lot like our area. This is our climate. They began to identify with Oregon, and um, as their, you know, in France, the temperatures are becoming way different, their weather is way different, and even back then they began to identify Oregon as a potential. And that international interest mm -hmm. and the Druin family coming here um, was very important for the industry. Mm -hmm. First, the investment of Argyle from um, an international investment, and then the Druins. Mm -hmm. I think that made a big difference. Very agree? much so. And then we, uh, you know, my first employee for our gal was, was Alan Holstein, who was farming Knudsen Vineyards, and, uh, and he'd done a couple other vineyards as well. And um, we managed to get, uh, convince Robert Druin to hire us to, you know, basically plant his vineyard and farm his vineyard. And I don't know, we, we farmed for, for Robert Duran for 20 years, 25 years. And the best part about that was we had direct connection with Robert and we learned so much from him. Mm -hmm. It was incredible. We'd make yeah. trips to Burgundy 
back and forth, and it was very, uh, it was enlightening, and it drove the viticulture very much for Argyle and for Canutes and Vineyards, what we learned from farming with Robert. And the second part was that uh, the uh, Druin family had a national distribution company in the U.S., along with, owned also a minority share by Bollinger, and Bollinger was a partner in Petaluma in Australia. And so with those connections, uh, we, Argyle was able to flow into this national distribution, which caused us to instantly have a wholesaler in every little state of the U.S. Doesn't mean that people were buying the wine, but at least we had wholesalers because independently, if you, you, it even happens now, if you find a restaurant in New Orleans that wants your Pinot Noir, you got to go find a wholesaler. And the wholesalers go like, no, nah, you know, you're from, we don't even know where Oregon is type deal. And it was really bad then, I mean, it's still the case today. Uh, but by uh, having the um, capital to invest, the expertise to apply to the vineyards and the winemaking, and then to have national distribution was key uh, to finally getting Oregon wines all across the country. Talk about, you mentioned earlier the improving viticulture as you were coming in and, and caused by you and others. Tell me about some of the steps that you saw um, as Oregon was sort of figuring out how to grow grapes properly uh, as, as the people were coming in. Tell me about some of the sort of incremental steps you saw in uh, viticulture progress. Um, the best part about it all was that um, my feeling is that we're the Americans that went over to the Europeans and asked for help. It's not typical American activity, is it? <laughs> Especially, you know, as we're recording this. Um, but we, yeah, and, and it was phenomenal because the Europeans came back in spades. We had the Alsatians coming over, we had the Swiss coming over, but, you know, we had French folks. It, it really was mm -hmm. amazing. And, you know, oh, well, you guys shouldn't be using California sprawl viticulture. You should be using upright vertical, you know, VSP like we do in Alsace. And they're like, oh, okay, in Switzerland, oh, okay. Um, you know, you guys should t pay attention to how many buds per acre you're leaving and not leave too little and not leave too many, that kind of thing. Um, I think we came, might have come up in the Willamette Valley with leafing. I want to say Joel Myers might have thought about it to open up the canopy. Right. And that might have been one thing we shared with the uh, Europeans. Uh, they also brought in higher density. I mean, we were planted in nine foot rows. You know, there's a vineyard still in the Dundee Hills. It's 12 foot between the vines. Mm -hmm. So we moved our row spacing into six, seven feet. Um, I remember when Robert Duran was, you know, talking about planting his first block. We were convinced that the soils were so vigorous in the Dundee Hills that if you went with really high density like he wanted to do, you'd have a complete jungle. And he completely and utterly proved us wrong. Uh, so the first block we planted for him was seven foot between the vines. Subsequently, the next year, he just, you know, dug his toes in and said, well, I wanted to have one meter between the vines, but I'll go with, I think we ended up with something like 1.2, 1.3 meters between Gosh. the vines. And now kind of a standard for around Argyle world is 1.5 meters between the rows. Um, so that density. And then when we found Phylloxera in 1990, it was, uh, you know, Alan Holstein and, and the guys from Mandavi up in the Dundee Hills and they dug roots up and, you know, it's Alan and I and, and the Mandavi guy and we see, boink, there's the sure sign of Phylloxera in 1990. So, you know, next time we saw Robert, he pulls out the book on, you know, how fast Phylloxera went through France, which was lickety split, just scared the bejesus out of us. Mm -hmm. And so we got information from France about what rootstocks to use. And, uh, what might work, and that was a leg up. Sure. And then subsequently, uh, Adelson working with Raymond Bernard and, and pulling in these uh, Burgundy clones mm -hmm. was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. That Oregon, through Oregon State, and the Burgundians would be the first place in the new world to receive 
Pinot Noir and Chardonnay vines um, you know, of these clones, new to the new world. You know, all that stuff added up to pretty extraordinary viticulture. So, was there a what was was there a point at which you felt like? Oregon was established, like that you that you could go on the road and try to sell Oregon wine, not have to explain what Oregon was or where Oregon was. No, still we're doing that. Yeah. <laughs> still, yeah. you can go all over yeah. the world and people don't know where Oregon is, or continue yeah. to say, "Oh, you, you know, you make you make they make grapes, <laughs> yeah. and we grow grapes and make wine in Oregon." Yeah, it's still a struggle. Sure. It's not as much a struggle <clears throat> mm -hmm. for sure, but. It's, it's still a struggle. I think a lot of the international you know, reviews and everything certainly assist the Oregon wine industry, mm -hmm. but um, it's, and as brands increase, it's ever more a struggle. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we've got, I mean, I feel like for the size that we are, which is tiny compared to the rest of the world, even Burgundy, mm -hmm. we get a lot of good press. So that's yeah. that's a wonderful thing. So, But they've defined us as we're just Pinot Noir. And eventually that's going to be a little bit of an Achilles heel. And you know what, we just because we're just Pinot Noir means we're, we're actually a cool climate, mm -hmm. um, number one. But the other part is the critical mass. Um, you know, Chablis has 11,000 acres, just Chablis alone. And here in the Willamette Valley, I don't know what we are, 5,000? I, I don't know. Half that, half yeah. the size of Chablis. Mm -hmm. so We're small it, and Oregon's small. <clears throat> it's, so it's critical mass to, once we grow vineyards, grow production, more and more people will get to know us. And, and I think we'll end up becoming an exciting region from the point of view that um, as Americans know wine, they'll realize that the Willamette Valley makes a style of wine that's never been seen in America before. And that part's really exciting. Mm -hmm. We offer something completely different, fresh and vibrant than any other place in America. It really does have, as Corby said, terroir here. <coughs> What is it special about the terroir? What do you what do you find most exciting about it? Um, well, if you think about it, um, the Willamette Valley is. In the, what, we, we've been talking Oregon, but you know, let's narrow it down. The Willamette Valley is what's really driven the success of viticulture and mm -hmm. and winemaking in Oregon. And it's going to be really important to distinguish between Oregon appellated wines and Willamette appellated wines because. Walla Walla is a completely different region, and Rogue River completely different, et cetera, et cetera. And when you blend them all together and call them or, uh, Oregon, it's, you know, it's like saying a California Appalachian wine, basically uh, different. But the Willamette Valley is the only New World wine region I can think of, one of the few, maybe Santa Cruz Mountains, where people uh, did not plant the valley floors first. They went straight to the hills. And most New World wine regions that are calling themselves cool climate would plant on the valley floor and eventually look up in the hills and go, like, oh, wow, we should be up there. But they were successful on the valley floor. Mm -hmm. And that drove their, their tons per acre and their ability to make a lot of wine to get into the market, et cetera, get a name for Anderson Valley, you know, for example. Well, Anna Valley, are, you know, the good news, bad news, we were on these hillside slopes. They're more expensive to farm, more expensive to develop, and you're not going to get these giant yields like you can in the more fertile valleys. So our challenge in the Willamette Valley is all one of them has always been to compete um, for price. Mm -hmm. for, for example, we'll never be able to compete for price because we don't get the yields per acre and our costs are higher mm -hmm. uh, here. But it does set us out as a very different region to any other wine region in the world. We're also 45th parallel, and that's, if you follow the 45th parallel, um, you know, Europe is kind of positioned with a lot of grapes along 45, but no other, no other continent has very many grapes at the 45th parallel. Mm -hmm. right. So that's really different. And it's hard to explain to I think you have to taste to Yeah, true. 
our wines taste beautiful, and, but they're distinctively different. It's mm -hmm. really fun. Take me through your time at Argyle a little bit. Uh, what were some of the things you were, the accomplishments you had that you were proudest of? At Argyle? At Argyle, yeah. Oh, wow. I don't know. Just surviving. <laughs> it was tough to survive, I gotta say. When you put all your money into uh, bottles of wine that are gonna go into bins and you're not gonna come back to them for three years. If you start a sparkling wine program, you, you make wine for three years with no sales. So financially, it was really, really, really tough. Sure. So surviving, mm -hmm. that's the big one. <laughs> um, and I think Argyle had the first successful direct-to-consumer tasting room in Oregon. And it showed, it was a great example for all Oregon wine people mm -hmm. that you can do DTC mm -hmm. here in Oregon because nobody else was really doing it. Right. And they watched Argyle grow and grow that direct-to-consumer, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and that was very successful. Yeah. So I think that that was a, kind of a shining star for the rest of the wineries, you know. I remember David Adelsheim when he built mm -hmm. his um, new winery out on Calkins Lane him saying, oh, we don't really need a taste room because nobody's going to come out here and taste wine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, they do. You just have to yep. um, market it and put it out there. So I th think that was it was important. a success for our guy. Yeah, it was a key element of, you know, trying to put money in our pockets so we could afford to live another day. Right. Um, but we all, but we recognize it was important, that's for sure. Right. And then we've made some seriously well respected sparkling wines. Mm -hmm. We made you know, wines that were 10 years yeast on the, you know, in the bottle, and nobody in America attempted that kind of thing before with the kind of success we sparkling had. Sparkling wine. Sparkling wine. We made right. the first single vineyard sparkling wines mm -hmm. for uh, uh, Blanc de Blanc and uh, Bl uh, Brut uh, Noir mm -hmm. style wines. So that was really cool. And then we managed to really show ourselves with Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. So the, I guess the one thing I would be most um, proud of is that not one single wine, the Riesling, Chardonnay, Pinot, or Sparkling that we made was of ordinary quality. Mm -hmm. It's very unusual to find a winery that can be a, a specialist in that many categories. Yeah. So let's talk about the decision to start Rocco then. At uh, what, what point did this become an idea in your head? <laughs> we, uh, Roland had a piece of property that he'd had since 1986 up in the Shehalem Mountains. Um, and years after we were married, um, we kind of looked at it and said, okay, let's build a home there. And um, as we thought about building the home before I knew it, Ron was putting in vineyards. <laughs> and so after a year, a few years, so we moved into the house in 2001, something like Two. that, 2002. Um, and in 2003, because the uh, vineyards were planted a year before we moved in, we had a small crop, so we decided to make some wine and, and the vision was just to make, make enough wine for ourselves mm -hmm. and for our friends. We had a small mailing list um, and that was our first private stash in 2003 and it went like hot cakes and of course Roland had all these distributors who were selling Argyle across the United States and a few of them said hey can I have some of that? So we proceeded growing that for several years and pretty soon um, we had international distribution. We weren't selling any DTC. We were just distributing nationally and added the um, Willamette Valley brand on then and mm -hmm. started buying grapes and slowly build the business. Um, I was doing nonprofit work at that time, uh, running nonprofits, um, mm -hmm. doing grant writing, uh, such like that. And we had enough um, business that we, said we need to have a piece of property to run the business. We bought this piece of property and only, um, and built a winery mm -hmm. in 2009. And so we stopped making wine at Argyle. We were starting to annoy them with our production. <laughs> and housed it here in 2012. We built 
the tasting room mm -hmm. and just slowly built the business and it was pretty much like well you know someday we're going to have to retire um, Rollins job had become positioned bigger and bigger and bigger he was not just a winemaker he was the general manager for the, and doing international sales mm -hmm. and on the road a lot so we were building this brand with the plan that in about four or five years Rollin um, would move down here full time or come to the business but you know nine years later <laughs> Rollin was still at Argyle and there was a point where it, we had grown big enough that I needed help so it was either hire a winemaker and hire some people to come work for us or else Rollin would and, and that's the time so after 27 years at Argyle he jumped here um, full time. Yep. So that's quite a little friends and family business you started there. Yeah, and um, it's interesting because I would say that 90% of all people who start a winery in Oregon start with DTC sales, direct to consumer. So they, even before they build a winery, they build a tasting room, make their wine somewhere else, and do that. Mm -hmm. We didn't bother with DTC until we were 12 years into our business because we were distributed nationally mm -hmm. and selling all of our wine nationally, which was the back ass word play way that everybody does it now, but for us it was very successful. Mm -hmm. So by the time we got around to DTC, we already had income coming in nationally, which made it easier for us to start a business on our own without having to ask for you know, any kind of financing or anything. Mm -hmm. It could just be a business that belonged to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. What were your wine goals here? Did you have, when you started making this wine from this vineyard, did you have something you wanted to try differently? Well, the first thing was that the vineyard that we planted is extraordinary. And having bought it so long ago and not having planted it was, was a good, good thing because if I'd planted it when I bought it, we would have been tearing it out because it would have been on its own roots, would have been wide spaced, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But this vineyard site is where the, um, sedimentary soils of the Chehala Mountain begin. And so it's uplifted sandstone and shale. The majority of it's Willikinsey soiled, mm -hmm. but we have water. So we have a year round spring with water rights to it. And the spring, you know, we have two springs. And, and so we irrigate out of one of the two springs and that spring runs, at, I don't know, right now, it's one of the driest growing seasons ever. And it's, I guarantee it's running at like eight gallons a minute. Mm -hmm. And so to have sedimentary soil, high density planting, divigorated rootstock, but the ability to, to put a little bit of water on has made this vineyard to be extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And today we've got really, I mean, I had so much experience in what clones to put where. Um, and so we applied that to Rocco. It was an opportunity to take what I'd learned from my experience at Argyle and put it into Rocco. So Rocco got it instant, you know, like, Whoops, wish we hadn't put those clones there. We never, we've never had that experience. Sure. And then the second part was that, you know, uh, Argyle's gotten large and it's a big ship, doesn't turn very quickly, which is, you know, a sign of success. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't like the old days where we had smaller production and, and we could make s snap judgments. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I grew up with, um, basically, having started Argyle. We had to be flexible about what was going, you know, let's try this, uh, let's try that. And so Rocco's allowed me a platform to do just that. And today, I've, it's pretty cool, we've, uh, Rocco, rather, Argyle was established on vineyards that were derived from volcanic soils. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I really understand those soils and wine making that goes along with it. And then I put Rocco, the majority of our vineyards are on those sedimentary sandstone soils, which if I'd stayed at Rocco, I would not have had the experience of making wine from those things. Stayed at Argyle. Stayed at, if I'd stayed at Argyle, that would not have it. Sorry. So Rocco, you know, we're marine sedimentary derived. And the other part was I've found that I have got a lot more creative. And we've, we've, we've come up with crazy stuff like the only red wine in the world that's been de-stemmed and then re-stemmed. Our stalker brand. Our stalker brand. Well, yeah. Rolling can certainly, because it's our own business, and um, it's not driven by 
what a marketing arm will tell you that you have to produce. Mm -hmm. Produce, give me all of this, you know, I want 2,000 or 4,000 cases of this. Mm -hmm. um, Merlin, we can play. Yeah. Where did you go with the idea for the stalker? I'd been wanting to use stems, you know, grape stems. And stems and stalks are the same. Australians call them stalks, and Americans call them stems. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, uh, so I wanted to use stems, but I don't really enjoy whole cluster fermentations until they're like five years old. Mm -hmm. But I love the texture that stems give um, a Pinot Noir here. And um, I finally figured out what to do. So I separate the berries uh, from the stems and then the berries cold soak for 10 days. And while their berries are cold soaking, I age the stems separately. And they go from being really green to being quite brown. Mm -hmm. They go from smelling like the worst mezcal you've ever smelled in your life <laughs> to smelling like cardamom and forest floor. So I get the tannins of stems, but I don't get those robust, you know, broccoli, mm -hmm. green aromatics. Mm -hmm. And it's worked out to be pretty cool. It's fun, yeah. And we, had Aust we always seem to have Australians working in the cellar, and so the Australians labeled all the barrels the stalkers, and that's how the name came about, <laughs> type deal. Uh, so we've done that, and then uh, we've really honed Chardonnay production here, mm -hmm. where I feel strongly that that um, the best white burgundies I've ever tried, besides Chablis, are always full malolactic fermented and full barrel fermented. Mm -hmm. But yet they still maintain this beautiful acidity um, when you taste the wines without food. And I was determined to to understand how can I do that mm -hmm. and still maintain this beautiful mineral line through our Chardonnays. And so in small batch productions here, I've been able to test some things out that, that, I, that I think have really convinced me that we can make those style of wines here. We don't need the crutch of stainless steel fermentation or a portion of it being no malolactic for acidity. Mm -hmm. And that's been really cool. And the fact that um, sparkling wine is the foundation of our marriage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love bubbles and um, certainly Rollins' knowledge, um, extended knowledge of making beautiful Method Champenois sparkling wines um, was, you know, one of the reasons that I cried out for us to make sparkling wine here too. So I could have easy access. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> and it's high-end, beautiful, uh, yeah. sparkling wine that no one, and I don't think, makes it as wonderful as Rowland does in the United States. Um, and his wines are always beautiful, and that's how we decided for years. Rowland said, "No, no, no, we can't because it's too expensive." Mm -hmm. And certainly, what every, what keeps everybody from making sparkling wine. In the valley is the expense. The equipment to do method champenois is extremely costly. And um, so we were part of founding a company called Radiant Sparkling Wine. It was the first bottling, sparkling bottling um, company in the United States, mm -hmm. a mobile bottling company in the United States. And they were housed here for the first year or two, and that allowed us, at that same time, it, that allowed us to be in our first sparkling wine program. Mm -hmm. You mentioned your vineyard that you now live on and, and plant, didn't plant. What, what, what originally drew you to purchase that site, and, and why didn't you plant right away? Um, money, well, money, money. Yeah, really, money, for sure. <laughs> I mean, everything was being plowed into Argyle. Everything, mm -hmm. and so yeah. so no money, mm -hmm. and and so the property had cows at times and horses at times. I cut hay on it, but it had this beautiful uh, south-facing tongue of sedimentary soil with these water rights, mm -hmm. and so I just I mean I knew in my heart it was going to be an extraordinary place, and it was a happy accident that we couldn't afford to plant it until 2001. Yeah, lots of 
time to decide what to do and what not to do on the property. Absolutely. Point. It turned out great. It's, yeah, it's a beautiful piece of property. Extraordinary. And you named it Wits End. We yes. did. Why did you do that? Um, because we didn't think Twits End would sound good. <laughs> <right. laughs> because we are at Wits End there. I mean, building the property and building the house at the same time, besides being financially straining on us, was, you know, a big step for us. Yeah. So there's often um, found ourselves at Wits End. And the joke yeah. is that's where we live, so that's where you often find us. Yes, at Wits End. <laughs> But it is funny, so we had a sign out at Wits End and one of our friends, an Australian friend, of course, came to a party there. Um, we had a house full of 150 people or so and people were laughing when they came in. Oh, good, good sign, good sign when I came in. Of course, I rolled out of the property the next day and he had taken masking tape and turned Wits End into Twits End. <laughs> it's good Everybody trick. knew but us, yes. Yeah, and he got the tape from Corby. <laughs> <laughs> And said, hey, do you have an asking I said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting to me that you came in uh, sparkling and Chardonnay. That was kind of the first things you were doing. And those are sort of now the hot things in Oregon wine, uh, mm -hmm. sparkling and staking off, partly because of Radiant. Uh, and Chardonnay is, is becoming. Uh, so I'm curious about the. You've been making it for basically 30 years now. Tell me about the reputation and how it's changed, and the quality and how it's changed in that time for Oregon Chardonnay and Oregon Sparkling Wine. Um, you go, Migo? No, you go. Oh. We might have different opinions. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, well, you know, no wine reason can survive on one bridle alone. And like, I used to joke that the only reason that Pinot Noir was given to the Willamette Valley was because in California they realized that Americans weren't drinking Pinot Noir. So, you know, yeah, we'll let Willamette Valley have Pinot Noir. We're not going to fight them for it. And, um, but, you know, um, the majority of Burgundy is planted Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. I think it's like 60, 40 Pinot Noir, uh, uh, Chardonnay to, to uh, Pinot Noir. Matt Wild. Uh, and so the potential's here. Uh, very much so, and so it was just a matter of fighting it out. The, I mean, the California Chardonnays are so completely different than our style. I mean, they're a unique style of Chardonnay. You will not find California style Chardonnay being made anywhere else in the world. And my contention is, you know, the Australians and the South Af Americans and the South Africans have tried to make California style Chardonnay to, so they could sell it into the U.S but they've not been successful. So it's a very successful style of Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. So most Americans' exposure to Chardonnay was not from Burgundy, it was from California. Mm -hmm. So it was made sense that when we were making sparkling, uh, Chardonnays that were not at all anywhere near what a typical California Chardonnay would taste like, um, that Americans would you know, be like this. Mm -hmm. And so it's taken much longer to break down that barrier to go, well, you know what? Chardonnay can taste a different way if it's made in America. And oh, by the way, from the Willamette Valley. And I think we finally, we're just starting to chip away at that. The second part was winemaking wise, I'm gonna, it's, my contention is that um, because I made cutting edge sparkling wines, my Chardonnays were cutting edge. Because I made cutting edge Chardonnays, my Pinots were cutting edge. It's never the other way around. So if you, become famous for being a red wine maker, mm -hmm. very seldom will you become famous or well known for making a white wine, Interesting. much less a sparkling wine. So, so Chardonnay is much more difficult to get right than it is to make a, a red wine right. It's easier to make red wine. Correct. And the picking decisions good. easier, all that. Chardonnay yep. and sparkling wine, but yep. yeah. Yep. Interesting. So that's why it's taken a while for Americans to realize, oh, you know, here's another style of Chardonnay that I should get behind. I should get behind. We were all used to California, mm -hmm. of course, having lived in California at wineries. Um, every, you know, everybody was used to that heavily oak style, that really oaky, deep, rich, and it was hard for them to believe that there was another style. Mm -hmm. You know, and if they if they identified and were drinking. Um, white Burgundies, they didn't understand that that was Chardonnay. They had no idea that that was Chardonnay. This is white Burgundy, you know, I'm not drinking Chardonnay. Yeah, so sure. 
for us to take a white burgundy style, which is more like we're doing here in Oregon, the cool climate, our, um, you know, not heavily oaked, uh, and to introduce that to them as a Chardonnay was like a bit of a shocker for um, consumers. Mm -hmm. But I believe that they've come to understand that that's a much more beautiful food wine than a heavily oaked Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. On that note, let's talk a bit about your sort of marketing philosophy and how you've developed it, selling wine. And I'm curious especially about sort of the consumer education aspect since you've had to do so much of that over the years. So what is your, how would you describe your marketing philosophy and how have you been successful at selling wine? Um, you know, and it's changed over the years too because first you were just marketing Oregon. And mm -hmm. I believe that Rollin and I still are big proponents of marketing Oregon mm -hmm. because, and Willamette Valley in particular. Willamette Valley is what it's about when you're um, marketing Oregon wines, I think, here in this area because that's what people remember. So first they, know, they recognize we're making wine in Oregon and then they have brand recognition of Willamette Valley. So we're still strong on Willamette Valley. It's on all of our labels. Mm -hmm. But for us, because we're a small winery, you know, um, it's predominantly about marketing ourselves as a smaller um, boutique winery and we're not um, you know making we're not making a large production low-end wine mm -hmm. so of course it's become from the overall focus just focusing Oregon then focusing on Willamette Valley marketing that and now into marketing something that's very personal to us mm -hmm. uh, about it being a small family operation my children are all in the industry mm -hmm. in some way or the other uh, and so we're now very much um, focused on making high quality smaller production wines and, and really it's about Rollin because we have a long history in the area, and Ron's well known in the area, and he's had, you know, he's the only person in Oregon who's had top 100 Chardonnay, sparkling wines, and Pinot Noirs. Um, so that is, you know, so our marketing now has become much more focused, focused on our own um, vineyards and focused on our own smaller production. Mm -hmm. And it's about taking our many years of experience and um, distilling it into something that's very high quality and personal to us. How has it changed with the crowded marketplace in Oregon? How do you stand apart with 700 plus competitors? You know, how does anybody? The mar it's so competitive yeah. now, of course, and every wine reel tell you the same thing. It's, there's so much, um, there's not enough shelf space for everybody. So you have to really focus on being quality, I think. Mm -hmm. Every bottle of wine you pick up is not the same. Mm -hmm. um, and to get people honed in on quality, and I think that's what we do here. When people walk in, they say, gosh, these are beautiful wines. None of our wines are not beautiful. And that's hard. We just did you know, a big rosé tasting in here the other day and had seven, you know, five of them Oregon and two Washington rosés and there was an extraordinary you know extraordinary difference between all those rosés we didn't put our own in there it was all about tasting other people's rosés mm -hmm. um, and what comes to mind to me is that there are still so many people here in Oregon who are still learning how to make wine mm -hmm. they don't they don't come here with experience they come here from other industries and say anybody can make wine and so they proceed to try and there's a large learning curve mm -hmm. to make really good wine. Um, and so because we also had a national distribution before we had DTC, we've already got shelf space. But I'm not going to tell you it's still not a struggle because it is. Selling wine is a struggle. What other industry, I can't think of one, that you take it all the way from the vineyard to growing it to producing it, to taking it out and doing door-to-door -door sales, mm -hmm. which we still do. It's personal. We go out and do it. Mm -hmm. Rollin goes out and do it, does it. So, it, um, yeah, I don't know that there's any secret to doing it. You just have to um, be able to tell your consumers um, and show them by putting a beautiful wine in front of them. Mm -hmm. That's the best you can do. How have the consumers changed? They've gotten older. <laughs> I mean, the people who, are, who have a lot of money to spend um, are older, and as they do that, they retire, and then they stop spending that kind of money and start you know, dwindling down. So one of the new um, 
trend, of course, is to bring millennials into drinking wine. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the, that's how they've changed. So now you're marketing to a lot of more millennial markets, trying to introduce them to drinking quality wines, that it's certainly an uh, alternative to drinking alcohol, which many of them are used to doing. Mm -hmm. um, so you're marketing more to millennials. Mm -hmm. And so you're doing a lot more social media um, than you've ever done before. So it's gone from just you know, going out door to door and, and greeting people in your tasting room to continually setting out your brand, 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 brand. Mm -hmm. And what are, how are millennials different? And besides how you market to them, what is it they're looking for from you? Um, fun, price point. Mm -hmm. You have to bring them in at a lower price point than you would um, people who are more accustomed and interested in mm -hmm. just quality wines and collecting. I don't know that they're really collecting yet. They are about the experience, about sharing it with their friends, about eating good wines. I mean, matching wines with good food, sure. so doing the good pairing. Um, so it is a much more social um, opportunity for them than it is for people who are out collecting wines. They're there for the experience, yeah. But there's no brand loyalty anymore. It's a much more fis um, much more fickle consumer um, thing out there than it has ever been in the past. Because you used to be able to, you could grab a consumer, they'd be with you for 20 years. Mm -hmm. But now with all the other brands, they're flipping clubs, mm -hmm. and the millennials don't join clubs necessarily. You know, they're all into let me come, let me have fun, give me some fun, you know, something fun to drink, mm -hmm. and so yeah, it's different, really different. Interesting. Well, we're talking about philosophies, well, let's talk about your winemaking philosophy and how you've honed it over the years. Um, well, I think I'll go back to what Corby's talking about first, is that if you think about it, um, uh, there's never been a time we've had more wine in the whole world, and never been a time when it's been better uh, across the globe. And in America, there's never been a time when the demographic is broader, mm -hmm. better drinking wine. We've got people from 21 years old all the way up to old people like me uh, drinking wine, and that is new to mm -hmm. America. Mm -hmm. We, but at the same time, we're not a wine drinking uh, country compared to Europe. Mm -hmm. Our consumption is, you know, a fraction of what typical European consumption is. And if you go back one generation or two generations, like taking a millennial, go back two generations those grandparents drank hardly any wine at all, mm -hmm. if any. And so we still are a very young com uh, world for wine, and millennials maybe are still trying to figure out this whole thing um, that's going on. Mm -hmm. And I think as they get, my hope is that as they get older, they're going to um, get, develop some loyalties, uh, develop an interest in learning more about um, what goes into winemaking and in this region and that region, more details because they are can be detail oriented. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the future for wine is you know real, you know, pretty pretty bright here because the kids of the millennials will be growing up in households drinking wine. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, and, <laughs> yeah. So that's so that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, but it is you know it's it's tough out there because there's so many wine brands around the globe. Uh, all wanting to sell into the U.S. and so it's, it is really hard to stand out um, through all the noise. Mm -hmm. uh, but we hope that consistency of really high quality is what finally people have come to roost upon. Sure. Um, the hard part too is how do you get your wine information? Because there's not that much in the way of, I mean, who do you learn about what great wines really are? Where do you go? Where do you go? And you can go to a magazine, you can go online, but you're going to get everything under the sun. I mean, we've seen that with social media already. Yeah. Things that supposedly, this is, I'm an expert at this, but they're actually so full of BS, it's not even funny. <laughs> so that's, I have sympathy for that part of millennials and young people learning about wine mm -hmm. in a proper fashion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, your, uh, winemaking philosophy uh, and how you develop it over the years. 
I don't know. Aren't we finished developing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the whole idea. I am fully developed. Yeah, really. I'd, I'd say for me, personally, as a young person, it truthfully took me probably 10 years in the industry to understand what I always call the big picture. Mm -hmm. And the big picture is really, really difficult to obtain in winemaking. Winemaking and wine, grape growing is deceptively complex. When you explain it to someone, it sounds so easy, but it's, but it's really not. And that's a big part of it, learn, being humble enough to know that you, you still have a lot to learn is a really big deal. Don't make wine by recipe or you'll fail. At the same time, there are standards to be set in place that, you know, that if you fail in those, then you'll probably fail in your approach to grape growing and winemaking. Cutting corners, every time you'll get, you'll get caught up. Oh, I'll just do, do this because I'm tired and I want to go home. And sure enough, it comes back to bite you in the butt. Um, so, um, Crozer, Brian Crozer used to say that uh, that every small compromise added up becomes a big compromise. And I've always been a big believer in that mm -hmm. portion. Don't compromise at, you know, at all. Mm -hmm. And then that consistency of high quality is utterly important. Mm -hmm. Don't put something in the bottle that's substandard because that reflects on, on you forever. I'm the one that has to stand behind a table and pour my wine with a smile on my face and go I'm like, isn't this great wine? <laughs> Knowing what terrible thing I did to this wine. <laughs> Corby and I are going after the natural winemaking thing lately and it's just great because it just cracks me up. And it's just a sign that young people um, that would grab onto natural winemaking and first of all, how do you define it? Mm -hmm. But there's some real flaws in many, many, many of those wines, and they don't live very long, and it, you know, it, we just were chagrined by, how, how can I put that in my mouth? <laughs> it tastes like nothing I've ever tried before. Oh, it's natural. And I was up thinking that I've been making wine naturally all my life, <laughs> and I have. So the natural wine moving is using the same things that I might use, but without any discipline, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. It's a business where you always have to be continually adjusting, adjusting to the market, adjusting to price points, adjusting to people's perception, adjusting to you know how many labels there are in the market, new people coming in. It's, you're always going, you know, even in marketing here, we'll look at the numbers and We'll go, oh gosh, you know, we got to work really hard in the next two months because we want to get those numbers up. That means adding new events to mm -hmm. it. And you have to be able to respond at the last minute. You can't just plan a year and go, oh, that's what I'm going to do all year and then lay back and let that just happen. It can't be like that. No. You have to be able to go, oh, okay, that's happening now. I have to make accommodations for that. So it's, you can't be asleep at the wheel and have a successful brand. Mm -hmm. So you can be asleep at the wheel if you are non-motivated and you don't have a plan mm -hmm. but we want to continue to grow the business so there's no opportunity for us to do anything except okay what are we going to do now how are we going to make the adjustments to that what are we going to do to improve that you know, yeah. never let anything just be okay mm -hmm. it's got to be better than okay so. yeah corby really has a, a knack for reading the market reading the environment and then putting together you know just like that messaging Mm -hmm. that I've had people come up to me and go like, man, I'm not even in the wine business, but that messaging is spot on and it's so creative. Mm -hmm. And so you can't do marketing without being creative and without having an imagination, but also being disciplined enough to really understand where, where, who you're targeting and, right. and what really needs to be targeted. You can target gophers till the cows come home, but they won't buy an hour wine. <laughs> you had mentioned earlier the, uh, the the rising tide lifting all boats, and, and we've heard that from a lot of, especially the the original earlier winemakers Absolutely. in the area. I'm curious if you see that you're, as you, if you've seen that happening in terms of winemaking style and skill. Has is Oregon wine being made better now than it ever has been? Sure. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yep. 
there's a lot of third generation, or are they third, maybe third generation, second generation children mm -hmm. um, from founders uh, coming out in the industry, and I would say they are making wine better than their parents did in many ways, sure. but what they're using is all their parents' knowledge. Mm -hmm. So, and industry knowledge that we've all uh, acquired through, you know, farming together, hearing what's going on in, in Europe, taking in information as well as we can, making adjustments to our own um, farming techniques and, as, and wine making as mm -hmm. well. So, yeah, it's much better. Yep. Look at the improvements to Chardonnay even. Mm -hmm. So many more nice Chardonnays sure are. than there were 15 years ago. Yep. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Talk about some of the notable the successes you've had at Rocco's, the things that make you proudest uh, since you started Rocco. Um, growing our business every year, you know, we see a 20 to 25 percent increase yep. in business, so um, that's really nice. Uh, what also is proudest for us is that, you know, we don't have outside investors. Mm -hmm. This is all out of our pocket. Um, yep. So it makes you focus on the business way differently. It's like, you know, everything, everybody eats in that kitchen. If you didn't bring it here, it belongs to me. <laughs> you know, for people to understand that this is our personal um, money here that we've invested. So we're very personally... Um, a part of the business as well, so I think that's a, a big item. Yeah, and for me, from a winemaking, great growing point of view, just establishing a winery that's based on marine sedimentary soils after whatever, 25, 26 years of basalt, that's been really pleasing to me to see how different that Pinot Noir and the Chardonnays from those soils performs. And then I've really enjoyed what I always jokingly call the mission creep because we started Rocco's just going to, in my mind anyway, I was just going to make Pinot Noir. Right. And five years later, Corby says, you know, we really like Chardonnay. <laughs> so Mike, we make Chardonnay and it's, it's delicious. I mean, it's such a good wine. And I had not made Chardonnay off of marine sedimentary soils before. And then five years in later, we're all, you know, you know, we have a lot of champagne in our cellar. Why don't we make some? And so now we're making this RMS Brut. And that's been really exciting, too, because I've um, figured out a couple of little new little tricks there that are, that are just fun to try out and see how they work and see if they work out really well. Yeah. So from a creativity point of view, I'd say Rocco has really, really lifted my game mm -hmm. very, very much. And I don't think that we're very focused on how other people perceive us, although we certainly always put our best foot forward as far as um, customer attention and everything. I think it's a very personal thing for us. So between Rowan and I, it's always, hey, you know, wouldn't, you know, it's even all the little things we do that, you know, hey, that was really well done. Mm -hmm. It's, um, we're not focused outwards so much as we are focused on our own personal best mm -hmm. yeah. and um, running a business, you know, I mean, we share an office together, we see each other 24-7, so it's really all about us accomplishing something together, mm -hmm. um, more than it is about whether other people are, you know, like what we're doing. Mm -hmm. It's about us liking what we're doing. And yeah. about, it's about us enjoying what we're doing together and um, our personal goal of always being the best that we can be and that all the way down to how we present our lines and the ones that we make um, because it's us that we want to please sure. and each other rather than you know, it's you know really nice that people buy our wine. <laughs> Oh, yeah. nothing, but it wasn't ever, yeah, it nothing wasn't ever our first yeah. goal. Nothing goes in the bottle here until the boss tries it. Because <laughs> so honestly, yeah, you know, Corby really has a better palate than I do, and so it's pretty exciting. That's to, not true. Well, that's, that's what I think about when I'm putting together you know, my barrels and stuff like that. Is I go, I wonder if Corby's going to like it like this. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's pretty fun. It's, it's really adorable. Yeah. <laughs> Now, despite the fact that you are not necessarily making wine for other people, your wines over the years have been very well received. You've had many top 100 wines at Argyle and here, uh, Wine Spectator cover. I'm curious what that, what that means to you, to be recognized nationally, like, internationally like that. I don't know. It's nice. It's nice. I don't make a big deal out of it, though. <laughs> uh, 
It's nice. It's better than not having it. <laughs> exactly. It's it gives us something to say. It gives me it's something nice. to say. Yeah. I know. It's nice. I um, it's nice because it says somebody did recognize that we were working really hard all these years. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Our friend um, Mike Etzel from Beau Frere, when we <clears> had the spread in the Wine Spectator, <clears> said to me, Oh my God, I think he came in here, he made this. That's the best publicity you could ever get. I can't believe it. I mean, people got to be knocking down your doors over it. And Ron and I looked at each other and went, no? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and that's a great example of that fact that that's nice, mm -hmm. but that really, people don't really care that much. I mean, we get some attention from it. You know, I saw you there, I saw that ad, or, mm -hmm. um, but it's, everybody gets coverage. We're not, Unusual. Mm -hmm. We're um, just older. <laughs> no. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. We. I mean, we're not the type that suck up to the important wine press people, mm -hmm. and um, I've never been that guy. And so, as a result, it turns out that a lot of times those people will reach out to me about other stuff going on, and you know, that's kind of what I call the, the BS meter. And it's, it's kind of fun. Just yesterday, early morning, I had a thing going with these two wine writers about closures, back and forth and back and forth. It was just only lasted for about, you know, half an hour, but it was, they were like super interested. And it'll, and it'll never get printed. It was just, you know, they're trying to suss out what the heck's going on here. Rollin was the first winery in Oregon that came up with um, screw caps. Mm -hmm. So he, and the funny thing is, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that a bunch of other wineries had a small amount of their wines under screw cap, but they were hesitant to release it because they <coughs> didn't know what kind of response. And here Roland, of course, had done everything under screw cap. Mm -hmm. So he sends out a big press release, you know, he gets all this attention and all the others go, shit! <laughs> <laughs> under screw cap. Roland beat me one more time to the punch. That was pretty funny. Yeah. That's pretty funny. Okay, we're gonna pause. All right, so back for part two of our interview here. Um, you mentioned earlier your uh, involvement with uh, IPNC and its, mm -hmm. its inception, and you've also been highly involved in Salute and other programs. I'm curious, um, you're when choosing to be a part of an or, uh, organization like that or, or a project like that. Um, what is it that's drawn you to IPNC? What is it that drew you to Salute and, and to other things you've been involved with? For me, it was the good of the industry, so mm -hmm. or the cause behind it. Um, certainly, that was the IPNC bringing people to Oregon be, and introducing the Oregon wine industry mm -hmm. to the world because it was international. Mm -hmm. um, and for in doing the Yamhill County Wineries Association, it was again bringing a group of winemakers together. Mm -hmm to learn how we could all work together to market. Because mm -hmm. again, it was all about marketing. How mm -hmm. can we get together? At that time we were doing Yamhill County Winery events. We were uh, learning how to market our own wineries as a group, to using each other, one another, to draw people to us. And for Salud, it's certainly for the cause. Mm -hmm. um, I believe strongly in the cause, uh, which is to provide healthcare services and dental services and Vision services to our immigrant population, mm -hmm. where nobody else is paying attention to that, mm -hmm. their needs, and their needs are certainly extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So I, I believe it's always the um, cause and the premise of bringing all of us together to work towards a central good, mm -hmm. um, and that certainly is my interest. And I had great. Um, mentors in the industry, whether they knew they were my mentors or not. Um, that was Susan Sokolasa mm -hmm. early on, and Nancy Ponzi, mm -hmm. and David Adelstein, mm -hmm. all those people who were focused on not just their own personal welfare, but the uh, welfare bringing everybody together to work towards a common goal, um, and to do it with, um, with a sense of professionalism, um, and understanding that it was business, it wasn't personal, um, you know, because bringing a lot of people together to come to a group decision that says, okay, this is what we're going to do, you're dealing always with personalities. Mm -hmm. A lot of those personalities have a hard time 
getting out of themselves and what it means to them and how important it is that we do it, you know, and letting go of that and understanding that <coughs> us working together, um, letting go of your egos enough so that we can accomplish something that's really good. Mm -hmm. So I think those three people in the industry certainly, mm -hmm. you know, emulate that and bring that on and they were my mentors and still remain my mentors in many ways, mm -hmm. yeah. The industry, it's, it's interesting as you mentioned that, because the industry from the very beginning has had a bigger eye, uh, has an eye on the bigger industry rather than just people focusing only on their own, own libraries, right. focusing on land use planning and labeling laws and, and things like that. I'm curious if, um, if that's a lucky, if that's in your case, if that's something that happened that was lucky or if, the, or if it's just these people saw the need to grow the industry in a certain way and did it that way. In your, in your interactions with them, I'm curious, we always like to ask this, I'm curious if they, um, if, the, if it was just right people, right time, or if they kind of knew from the beginning how much they'd have to do for this industry to survive, if that makes any sense. I did, it does. <laughs> so from the beginning for me, because I, we were there mm -hmm. um, early on, early on at least it was um, definitely about um, how can we survive mm -hmm. together? It was very much a pioneer spirit, you know, people moving through an industry and moving into an industry together and realizing that working on our own wasn't as powerful as it was working together. Mm -hmm. So there was our desire to grow ourselves and our businesses, but we believed and still believe, although I think that's changing, mm -hmm. that working together um, was more powerful than working individually. And it was that there were a group of people who could work together, even mm -hmm. though we did uh, fight egos. I mean, those are a lot of people with egos mm -hmm. out there. Um, and so we did have to learn to set those aside, you know, and, and talk about each other afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> and today, I think that's still the same. People get together for a cause, but you see a lot more of meism, I think, coming out in the industry today. There's a lot of things that happen today that would never have happened long ago. Mm -hmm. um, it would have been discussion first, consensus, mm -hmm. and if there was lack of consensus, we would say, okay, how are we going to deal with this lack of consensus? Mm -hmm. But now there's a lot of action without consensus, mm -hmm. um, which begins to divide. And some of that is because as large corporations come in, they aren't interested in consensus. Mm -hmm. Or when people come in and they're very focused as, I can probably do this better from you, I did this somewhere else, mm -hmm. they don't come with the same spirit in which we originally come. So mm -hmm. I see um, the industry being less like that. And having children in the industry, I hear from them how competitive it, <laughs> competitive it is and less friendly than ever before. Mm -hmm. Um, and they don't feel that same spirit that we felt. That's true. And, so true. And we see it ourselves too. There's less of that spirit, and maybe that's just the way an uh, industry grows. Mm -hmm. You know, where you it always <coughs> and it's like a community. It's the same thing. Maybe that's naturally. I hate to see it mm -hmm. change, but um, I fear that it is. It is changing. Yeah, it's a pity, really. Um, uh, I, not to beat up on young people, but n newer people in the industry, maybe, and uh, younger young, people, not. and not all young, they don't. They act like they don't have the bandwidth to contribute to our industry. Right. And I've leaned on some of the people I thought could be really valuable, and you know, one of our committees, or you know, or you know. You know things that we do, mm -hmm. and they go. But Ron, you know, I've got my brand. I got to build and make the wine. I got to grow the grapes. I have a family, and they're going on and on like that. And I just keep looking at them, and uh, they finally go, Oh, oh yeah, you had a family. <laughs> you built a brand, and you had vineyards to look wow. after and wine to flog. So it's a, it's just a matter of digging deep and realizing that you know what, working together, we're going to be stronger. Mm -hmm. And what a lot of those same people do, I've heard them talking individually to a group of, you know, sales reps or something, talking about how cohesive we are in Oregon. And I just look at them and go like, so what have you done? Right. And what I, you know, what I think I really respect and I've, I've uh, managed to coach in some ways other wine regions that don't rely on, you know, like government money and government ideas and government funding and all that kind of stuff. Everything we did in here in the Willamette Valley, IPNC, People weren't drinking Pinot Noir, well, let's do something about it. 
Oregon Pinot Camp. You know what? We're really having a hard time getting wholesalers to bring in our wine. So why don't we bring retailers and restaurateurs here and don't bring any wholesalers? We pay to pay, pay to play on that thing. Salute. You know, it's obvious that the, that our health care system here is broken. And so what do we do in, in the Willamette Valley? We do something about it. We want to define the Willamette Valley, which is a giant AVA, a little tighter to show here's where the most successful grapes are in the shadow of their coast range and up above 200 feet. Well, we all got together and, and submitted, what was it, six AVAs mm -hmm. all at one time. It completely blew the TTB's brains out. They go like, you guys all got along that well. And I don't see that happening right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to encourage anybody new to the business and anybody that's taking over a, a successful business to, to dig deep mm -hmm. and carve out some time, come up with some great ideas that help all of us. Yeah. You mentioned uh, family in the industry. I'm curious what it's like working alongside with family uh, we, we spoke with Cody earlier this summer, we interviewed him. Uh, I'm just sort of curious what that's like, seeing a family scattered kind of throughout the Oregon industry. Um, we love it. I mean, when we get together, it's not like one of the members of the family is going, oh, this is so boring, what are you all talking about? We, we get what each other are doing. Mm -hmm. you know, our, our daughter, her husband is a vineyard manager with one of the largest vineyard companies mm -hmm. and um, my other son is selling glass mm -hmm. to the industries with a company called Ardow and so he's got this is region so he knows all the winemakers mm -hmm. in the region as well and Cody he has his own winery so we understand each other's problems mm -hmm. it's like hey I can't take the kids today we got a big event going on can you get the kids can you take the dogs hey I can't do this can you go over it? you know we get each other's problems, mm -hmm. which is really nice. Mm -hmm. And um, we under understand each other's successes and can share in that, which mm -hmm. is really nice too. We understand that it's a, it's a big deal if Cody got a nice score. We mm -hmm. understand that if Carson you know, picked up a new client, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we understand their successes and how much it means. Mm -hmm. So it's nice. We get it. Yeah, and it's yeah. fun to hear from them and they go like, you know, something really ordinary has happened. What do you think? And so I, I love fielding those things too, you know. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. we get each other's problems. Yep, yeah. it's cool. Do you get to see your influence in like Cody's winemaking style, for example? Do you get to kind of see, like you're talking about the second generation, do you get to see that? Oh yeah, I mean, what's fun with Cody's, you know, he's got, you know, He's got his dad, Ken, and he's got his stepdad, Raul, and then we make our wines very differently from each other. And, and he's then, worked for both. And he's worked for both, and he's trying to carve his own pathway. Mm -hmm. And what I love is that as time goes by, he's moving closer and closer to where Rollin is. <laughs> Kicks, it's just, I, mean, I don't say anything. And he's telling me, usually he'll only tell me on the phone or when I go over there and taste wine. And then, and I, I hope he never sees this. And that, I know. <laughs> I don't say anything, but it's pretty fun. But he's, he's his own guy, and his style is very unique and delicious, and he's been very successful, and we're very, very proud of what he's done. One of the unique things about Rocco that we notice is uh, the glass art that is Corby's specialty. Tell me a little bit about your glass art, uh, how you got introduced to it, and, uh, and what you enjoy about it. I ran a large nonprofit organization, um, art organization in Corvallis for eight or nine years. And, prior, and as a young kid, I did, through college, I did stained glass. So I had an interest in glass. And they were starting up a new glass program at the MU Craft Center. And so some of us who were interested got together to begin that program. We started taking classes everywhere, down in Eugene and up at Bullseye um, mm -hmm. and learning so that others could learn from us. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I just kept at it. It's you know, it's just that little thing in your head that you start thinking, oh, I have an idea, something I can do. So it's a small addiction, almost. You know, <laughs> um, in the middle of the night when I can't sleep, I design a glass glass piece in my head, and pretty soon I'm zonked out. It's <laughs> I I like working with my hands. I love color. Mm -hmm. um, I like creating things, and for me, it's a meditation. I can walk into the studio and just start thinking and watch it fall together, and mm -hmm. I enjoy it. Yes. 
Do you find that uh, customers are drawn to having glass here? And glass armor? I do. I'm always surprised at itself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, they bought that. So hmm, that was pretty cool. I am, and we do. We do really good. Uh, I do really good sales here, which is um, interesting. Yeah. I used to be in a couple other galleries, one on the coast and, and one in the valley here, and uh, I found that I can't. Since I work full time, I can't um, accommodate galleries any longer. Mm -hmm. So I just sell out of here. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's fun. It's sort of like Morocco has sort of become your guys like it's a, it's like your playground here. You it get to make the wines you want to make. You get to make the glass you want to make. Exactly. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> it is. So what's in the future for Rocco? What do you see happening in the next few years? What do you, what do you hope will happen? I don't know, just slow, organic growth. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing different than what it's doing right now. Yeah. Because it's so, you know, still a nascent organization, so. Yeah. Do you have a goal in mind for a size? Oh, I don't know. I don't know, we'll probably stop at around 10,000. We've been. Uh, between eight and ten thousand for the last few years. Mm -hmm. um, we'll probably s sit there and just take a look. We have no desire to be bigger than we can handle ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, nor do we want to make more wine than we can sell. Mm -hmm. So we just want to, yeah, mm -hmm. have a peaceful existence. I know. I helped build a big winery already, a relatively big. It's not big by California standards, but. It's big by Willamette Valley standards. And yeah. So I've been there, done that. Don't need, don't have any need to do that again. Yeah. What about anything interesting you're planning to experiment with? It seems like you're, you're always kind of tinkering with it. Why do you think exciting on the horizon? Um, I don't know. We have the Brut Rosé. First Brut Rosé is going to come out. Yeah. I think that's going to be pretty cool. That's awesome. And it's Roland gonna, made his first Rosé he ever made in his whole life last, last year. I know. It's my never say never. That's right. Wine. So it's always easy to think of something we can do as far as wine goes. So, yeah. Yeah. I always said I was never getting, the only good Rosé is one with bubbles in it. I still believe it. <laughs> but then I was tinkering in my head about one little technique that I thought might work for a, to make a really delicious Pinot Noir Rosé. Mm -hmm. I like Grenache Rosés more than I like Pinot Noir Rosés. They're usually fairly simple or out of balance and they're just gangly. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I wanted to try something out because I realized I have um, fewer vintages ahead of me than behind me. So I thought, well, okay, I give in. And I had to eat a lot of crow. <laughs> you did? Yeah. I thought you were never going to make a rosé. I don't know how many people come up to me, like many. Well, it's for, for years in the taste room, people would say, oh, you should make a rosé. I said, well, Ron will never make a rosé. One day, we made a rosé. Yeah. We both had to eat crow. <laughs> So you were talking earlier, and this is a really, really interesting point about the, the changing industry and the competitiveness and the lack of collaboration, the, the quick, sudden growth. What do you see on the horizon in the next decade in the Oregon wine industry? And what, both what you see happening and maybe what you might hope will happen. I see that there's going to be a lot more international investment. And so we're going to have a lot more international um, presence in the valley, and because of that, we'll get more recognition as well. So there's a good side to that. Mm -hmm. um, international presence doesn't always mean participation. So it'll be interesting how that comes mm -hmm. through. I think that there are a lot of people who come and think that they can make a lot of money in the industry, and they come from another industry, and they go, oh, you know, they all say, oh, my ideal is to always have a winery. So they come in and they build a label that really doesn't isn't associated with the winery. Their winemaker changes every year, and so my desire is that we see less of that, mm -hmm. because I don't think that brings us any good recognition. You know, there's no consistency in brand or consistency in quality when that happens. So um, that's what I see hope happening. I hope that the international influence and presence in the valley brings us uh, more knowledge, more marketing power. Um, I hope that we continue the trend with 
being predominantly small wineries that are only making five to 10,000 cases. Mm -hmm. um, but I anticipate that 20 or 30 years from now, that won't be so. Mm -hmm. um, do I like that? I probably won't be here to see it, so who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Everything has to evolve into what it's going to be evolved yeah. into. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so you have to be open to that. Yeah. Uh, I hope we've laid a foundation of mutual respect and mutual cooperation mm -hmm. that I hope mm -hmm. is, you know, transcended across time, because mm -hmm. that'd be pretty cool if, if we've laid that good foundation, which I think we really have. I think that's a real positive. I think, you know, uh, land's going to become more valuable here, so it'll cost more to enter into our industry, mm -hmm. um, which is good news, bad news. Um, with, you know, the international interest, that's a positive because it'll only, most likely only be the really professional entities that'll come over and try it out. Mm -hmm. uh, that might be a pos positive part of it. Um, I think that we're going to have, over time, a bit more definition of just what it means to be in this part of the Dundee Hills and that part of the Chehalem Mountains, so we'll further define our ADAs, if you will, and vineyard to vineyard, so that's kind of exciting. Um, to, if you think about it, our um, oldest Burgundy cloned wines. We have the biggest planting at Knutson. It was 1990. So, I mean, that's starting to get look old. But by far and large, we don't have a lot of really old vines mm -hmm. producing those different clones. And so it'll be fun to see how those react and what kind of the wines they end up making. Because mm -hmm. that'll probably help with the definition. Because we might have been seeing, oh, this is young vine and it tastes like that from this vineyard. And then um, five years later, this teenage vine probably tastes a little bit different from this same vineyard, so we don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, so further defining mm -hmm. our region would be really, really nice. And then I think it's really important that we, that we recognize the Willamette Valley and get that into the lexicon of people's um, um, jargon for mm -hmm. wine. Mm -hmm. You know, yep, I want a Chardonnay from the Willamette Valley. I also see sparkling wine becoming a big deal here mm -hmm. because it really is the only cool climate region that, that produces this style of sparkling wine. It's very, very unique and I think it's going to build importance on the world stage. Mm -hmm. There's room for more than just champagne. Yeah. What are the biggest obstacles you see uh, in Oregon's future? Uh, obviously, it's, been, it's on quite a quite an upward trajectory right now over the last couple of decades, especially. What are the obstacles to in the future? Obstacles. Uh, obstacles that are, hmm, we haven't named yet. Yeah, we've already named most of them. Okay. Yeah, I would just say continually, continual growth of wine industries, mm -hmm. um, not just here in Oregon, but across the United States. So competition, I mean, we're making wine in Michigan, Wisconsin, you know, that um, changes the national sales um, marketing. Mm -hmm. um, in Oregon, I don't know. I think we just look towards what, you know, places like that are really popular like Napa and Sonoma. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be tourist traffic. Yep. That's going to drive everybody nuts to have all these people on all these windy roads drinking wine and that kind of thing. So that's going to be pretty tough. Luckily, we put in place land use mm -hmm. um, controls. I think another challenging thing is going to be challenging land use. We had that a few years ago, and um, as the population goes up in the Willamette Valley, you're going to see more people challenging that state statutes for land use, mm -hmm. and that's going to be really tough to hang on to. Sure. Um, uh, so that's I think that's our biggest challenge yeah. besides you know, attention out in the, mm -hmm. in the world. I think that's going to get better. You know, young people drinking Prosecco, yep, they're going to end up in Champagne and the Lamp Valley sparkling wine someday as they get older. Young people drinking Pinot Grigio, well, that moved them off of, you know, ordinary California Chardonnays, yeah. and it moved them into better California Chardonnays and for sure Lamp Valley style whites. And so that's 
So, you know, changing tastes mm -hmm. will change in our direction because the wines we make here are the ones that really do taste great with food. They're not a, they're not a just go out and, in a bar and drink them wines. Oh, what advice would you have for someone who wanted to enter the Oregon wine industry today? Who wanted to enter the enter the Oregon wine industry? Don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Make sure you know what you're getting into. Mm -hmm. Make sure you have a um, a financial base that's going to support you because the money you know you have to grow grapes or mm -hmm. buy and produce before you ever get out into the market. Mm -hmm. I have a good marketing plan. Understand what it means to. Mm -hmm. um, market and brand and uh, sell your own wine. Mm -hmm. What's going to make you, you know, recognizable in the market? So have a good plan out there. Don't mm -hmm. just go into it and think that this is, you know, this is great, this is what I'm going to do for my retirement because you're going to lose a lot of money before you make any. Mm -hmm. So get some really good financial and business advice and do it because you love it. Mm -hmm. Don't do it because you think it's cool and because you think that there's money to be made in it. Do it because you really have a passion for the industry mm -hmm. because that's what's going to make you successful mm -hmm. is your passion to do something really well. And understand that the, the very fundamental level it's agriculture. Mm -hmm. So you're at the mercy of Mother Nature. It's going to change year in and year out. You're going to have vintages where it's really high production, really low production. You're going to have an agriculture, you're going to have an excess of Pinot Noir grapes planted and then all of a sudden it's going to, not going to be enough Pinot Noir grapes planted. You're going to have no place to make the wine and then all of a sudden you got way too many places to make the wine. I mean, it, that's what happens in agriculture. It's going to be, it's going to rain, <clears throat> it's going to have an awful vintage and yep. you've got to sell it anyway. Yep. Yeah. It's not a, it's not a commodity that, oh, I could, I could have sold a thousand more cases of this stuff. You just can't make it like that. Mm -hmm. It's not and a good thing to find. <laughs> yeah, and I tell, I tell winemaking type people that you only ha get one chance per year. So it's not like the beer industry where you screw up a batch of beer and what you do is you run it off to the college kids and, <laughs> and, uh, and make another one and do it right this time. Mm -hmm. With sparkling, I mean with uh, wine grapes, it's once a year. Mm -hmm. So be prepared. And, don't, don't, don't leave your brain at the door. Right. Well, thank you both so much. That's all the questions that I have. Uh, anything else I should have asked you? Anything else you'd like to mention here at the end? I know this has been quite I lengthy. So. Right. Well, thank you both so much. Yeah. I really appreciate your yeah. time and your answers. And we'll go ahead and stop. Sure.